it into the yep. sounds good the live stream and uh okay right. we are apparently live and i'm going to start my camera so we are almost, apparently live because i forgot that last time okay rolling so we're gonna wait a few minutes and let people join in and then we'll get going on tonight's uh, genesis week then you're recording there And my microphone is good. My microphone is good. And you can hear me. I can hear you. I can hear you beautifully. Amazing. We have the technology. <laughs> we have the technology. Al just doesn't have the know-how. Yeah. <laughs> little by little every week, I suppose. All righty. Well, we might as well start, I guess. I don't see anybody in the chat except people who were already waiting for half an hour. <laughs> Really? Can you see how long they've been waiting for? Yeah, because like uh, mm. Benevolent Satokorium uh, posted a comment at 6.56 p.m. Oh, go away. And Doki Doki Bible Club was at 6.37 p.m. Oh, <laughs> there they are. On, they're online now, right on. Excellent. So I'm going to say kick her off, huh? All right. Take it away. So we're going to dive into viewer questions about the Ice Age. This is Genesis Week. And welcome to this episode of Genesis Week, the weekly program of creationary commentary on news, views, and events pertaining to the origins controversy, controversy made possible by the supporters of CORE Ottawa, Citizens for Origins Research and Education. We provide some of the best pirate broadcasting anywhere. Coming to you this week from inside the hyperbaric biosphere at Creation Evidence Museum, and from whence... We hacked into the transmitter towers of the Miracle Channel. And by the way, they don't know about this. So this is uh, live, but it's hush hush. So we could come to you right across Canada on cable and satellite. Now, we're carried by GNS TV down in Michigan, all over the world um, on the Genesis Science Network and Roku. And of course, on the internet on Rumble and YouTube. You can always find us on one of those. Now, the Apostle Paul did not write about serving the Lord with all humility of mindlessness. But rather, we were here at Genesis Week, believe God gave you an intelligently designed brain for a reason. Now remember, if you get lost in cyberspace, you can just punch in wazulu.com or genesisweek.com and you can find us. Now, or you can head over to our Rumble channel. If you haven't visited Rumble, go check us out on Rumble as well, and don't be shy to share that with all your friends and family as well. Now, we can get extras there, uh, like uh, Crevo Rants, and full interviews with our guests. I'm your host, Al Vasho, here with my co-host, the world-renowned and infamous Ian Juby. Ian, how you doing tonight? I'm doing just grand, and just infamous. Oh, did you put infamous? I like infamous. Same thing. Same thing. <laughs> so are you ready to go for tonight's uh, live Genesis week? Sure. All right. Well, we'll let the viewers know tonight is Friday, March 1st, 2024. Do you believe it's already March 1st to you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can. <laughs> it's pretty incredible how fast it's going already. But hey, for those of you who caught our exhaustive seven-part series on the Wallam Alam, the Red Record... And it was exhaustive and very detailed and informative. you want to check it out if you haven't. But you will have caught our discussion about how the Ice Age was apparently recorded in the Red Record. You can go back and play these anytime you'd like on, on one of our channels, and you'll see what we're talking about. And coming up in this episode, we're going to get uh, more in-depth information for you and all the while answering your questions live right here in the broadcast. This topic 
triggered a barrage of fantastic comments, I've got to say, and questions from you, the viewers. So we also had an email from Keisha, if I'm not mistaken, from Ottawa. Is that right, Ian? Uh, that is correct. All right, let's read it to you. Uh, da, 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 da. Let me pull it up here. I think it's already up. So Keisha from Ottawa writes, Hi, Ian. I have a question for you. One part in your complete creation video I didn't understand. I don't understand about the glacier layers like at Niagara Falls. Like what created or like what created that first riverbed? I, f I forget what you said, but I was curious about it and also curious about the Ice Age time that you had mentioned. Was there actually an Ice Age? Ian, maybe you can answer this one. Yeah, let's let's kick it off with there. And uh, Keisha, I've known Keisha since she was like three or four years old. Uh, so right. We go back a long way. She she was the prettiest little girl this side of Texas. She she's now well the the prettiest young lady because I mean she's well she's not a kid anymore. She's a mother herself, and uh, yeah, it's making me feel old. But anyway. Uh, but thanks for writing in, Keisha. It was uh, convenient that you would uh, write in and ask this question because it just fell in perfectly with the topic for this week. So uh, let's get into it. So was there an Ice Age? Now, surprisingly, this is one area I think both evolutionists and creationists will agree on, is that there was an Ice Age. Uh, we just tend to disagree on the time scale. Uh, there are some um, some sort of outlier theories as well, where uh, there are people who have models of the Ice Age, which sometimes involve hundreds of Ice Ages. Uh, we creationists, most of us would say, would say there was only one. Uh, most evolutionists, I think, would also say there was only one Ice Age. Um, there was, you know, the Little Ice Ages, which we'll get into in a bit. But they're they're very different. Um, but the first question that comes up is in all this topic is how do you even get an ice age? And interestingly, the creation account from the Bible is the only one that provides a possible an a plausible answer to that question. Because once you've started an ice age, so you can see here the you know the this is just a wild ballpark guesstimate. Nobody really knows, um, but there's reasons why they propose these boundaries for the ice sheets and the uh, encroaching ice and major ice sheets on pretty much all the continents, even down in New Zealand, um, over uh, Siberia and in Europe, and of course the Laurentide ice sheets and all the ice sheets covering North America, which were huge and extensive, presuming that these boundaries are even remotely accurate. Nobody really knows we weren't there. So with that, with that in mind, the problem here is once you've got all this white stuff around, what happens? That starts reflecting sunlight back out into space. So what happens is the ice and snow reflect heat away from the earth. So the first problem you run into is if you start an ice age, how do you stop it? Because it's sort of self-sustaining, if you will. But further to that, how do you even start one? Now, the evolutionary and deep time community do not have an answer for this. They just simply say it happened, it started. However, we creationists basing our theories on the biblical account specifically of a worldwide flood. We have a plausible theory as to how that started, but it's based on a global flood. So what I want to show you here, this is a map of, these are all what they call large igneous provinces. Basically, they're lava flows. And they are absolutely gargantuan. Uh, anybody who has driven the northwestern U.S., uh, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, 
you will have driven through the Columbia flood basalts, the Columbia River uh, large igneous province. And uh, you will literally drive for hundreds of miles through these massive lava flows. Now, here's, here's a photo I took. This was in, I believe this was in Washington, uh, but this was on the Columbia River. But look at this. Look at how thick this is. And we're talking hundreds of meters thick of these massive lava flows that, as you can see, just covered huge areas. And that's only one of the lava flows. You've got some up here in the Canadian High Arctic, the Siberian traps, which were much, much larger, significantly larger than the Colombian ones. You've got the Deccan traps, the lava flows in India, which again were larger, well, about the same size as the Columbia River one. But the point being here is there's profound evidence that all of these lava flows spilled out and flowed out onto the continents while underwater. And let me just show you some of that, that evidence. Uh, for example, this photo, if you take a close look at it, you can see what they call columnar basalt. So basalt is the type of rock, but you can see these columns in the rocks. And you also find these, these are called pillow basalts. And it's basically when lava is, when it comes out underwater, it cools it rapidly on the outside and kind of makes this uh, hard crust, which is expanding from the lava inside. And as it grows, it makes these pillow formations, these pillow shapes. And there are videos that you can actually look up on YouTube and other channels that uh, you can actually see these formations happening with underwater mm -hmm. cameras that they've filmed, which is kind of neat. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for mentioning that. Um, I may try and throw some video footage in there if I can. Um, so this is another, uh, this is a close-up. You can see uh, the columns in the lava flows. And in particular, when the columns kind of bend like this. And this was actually discovered in Iceland when they where there was a massive lava flow that was threatening a town. And so the what the people did was they poured a whole bunch of water on the lava flows to try and cool it, to make like a lava dam, to try and divert the molten lava away from the town. And afterwards, once everything had cooled down, uh, they cracked it open. And sure enough, what they found inside this lava dam that they artificially made by pouring water on molten lava, it was these columns of rock. And what they discovered was that when underwater, these lava flows, these massive lava flows, as they're sitting there, the water cools them. The rock contracts. It snaps into these typically octagonal or hexagonal uh, shapes. Vertical columns are quite beautiful, actually. If you've ever seen, have you ever been to Giant's Causeway or have you ever been to Ireland? No, that's the one place no, I'd I love to visit. Yeah, so I, I should have called up pictures, actually, but you can look it up mm. online. The Giant's Causeway is what they call it. And it's it's spectacular. It's these column basalts, columnar basalts, right? And um, so what happens is the water shrinks the rock as it cools, it cracks, and the water goes down the cracks and cools the, ro the lava down below. And so mm. it continues these cracks growing downward into these columns. So all these massive lava flows all over the world, which are all happening underwater at the time of Noah's flood, that's an awful lot of heat that is going into the oceans, what is currently Noah's flood. So once the flood, uh, once the floodwaters have run off the land um, and it's pooling in what is now our oceans, that water is quite a bit hotter than normal, than it is today. 
So what we've noticed, what was that hurricane that hit uh, New Orleans several years oh, ago? Um, uh, I meant to look oh that up goodness. before we started. Like, oh, wiped you up got the me on that one. Yeah, it like uh, took out the entire city. Like, <laughs> breached the breached so the levees. Somebody in the everything. comments, somebody in the comments, you need you, somebody watching. You need to pull it up and and comment. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. We'll bring it up. Oh, oh, Pastor Brian Edgar's got it. Katrina. I'm gonna call there that up on the go. screen. <laughs> Katrina, Hurricane Katrina. Thank you, Pastor Brian. Um, so uh, yes, Hurricane Katrina. So that year there was a lot of hurricanes that year, big hurricanes. Why? Because the ocean temperatures were warmer than normal and they weren't warmer by that much. So once you start, uh, if you increase the ocean temperatures, even the slightest amount, what happens is you wind up with massive air circulation and vortices and um, uh, also uh, evaporating a massive amount of water from the oceans. Where's that water going to go? It's going to fall on the continents as precipitation. You're also going to get cloud cover, which blocks the sun, etc. So a lot of this precipitation, combined with uh, what some creationists labeled as hypercanes, uh, they were just really large, super power. Hmm. I believe I'm not sure if we're live here. Uh, oh, here we go. My computer crashed. Oh, that was you. Okay. The, I thought it was the me browser crashed. Oh no. So give me one second. All right. I gotta load up the slides again here. See, this is why I was hoping you would open up the why you would load up the slides mm -hmm. I, because then I if i go it. down you don't go down <laughs> yeah is that okay. where we yeah that's where that's it Good. <clears throat> okay so you have these hypercanes uh picking up tremendous amounts of water from the warm oceans and dumping them on the continents a lot of that is going to come down as ice and snow. There's how you start your ice age. How the ice age ends is the oceans start cooling down. So you have the flood, you have these massive lava fields, all this uh, tectonic upheaval going on. This is all producing a tremendous amount of heat and dumping that heat straight into the floodwaters. Hmm. The floodwaters, which are now very warm, are sitting in the oceans. They're triggering hypercanes. They're moving massive amounts of precipitation onto the continents, probably a uh, hundred years or 200 years after the flood is when this really ramped up. And when it starts dumping massive amounts of ice and snow onto uh, the polar regions in particular, but not just them, all over the place. And all that happens is once the oceans now cool down, now the precipitation stops. It slows down, or it doesn't stop, it just slows down. <laughs> um, and so the ice starts melting back now because there's no more precipitation adding to it. So that, am, am I making sense there, Al? Did I miss Absolutely. anything? Okay. Very much okay. so. So there, there is basically the gist of the model. So we all agree, evolutionists and creationists amazingly agree on this one topic, that there was an ice age. We, we all mm -hmm. agree with that. And of course, um, the woolly mammoths are presented in museums, uh, the kids' shows, everything. You know, they're always presented in Arctic regions and walking in the snow. Here's the catch. That is probably not true. Uh, woolly mammoths, where we find them, we find them in Arctic regions now, what is now Arctic regions. Um, but the thing is, woolly mammoths would not survive in Arctic regions. Well, they wouldn't survive at all, much less thrive. And when we take a look in Siberia, there the mammoths number the millions 
in Siberia alone. So, but the problem is they require typically 250 kilograms of food per day. They also require about 150 liters of water per day. So, okay, yes, they could eat snow for water, but if they do that, they have to melt that snow. That consumes energy from their body, so they have to make up for that by eating more food. So it's a, it's a double whammy. You've got a real problem here. Uh, furthermore, we've got oil glands for our hair follicles, for those of you who have hair. <laughs> How are you doing up there? Uh, I, I didn't want to say it. Well, well, let me let me just say I'm not going to bend my head forward. Okay, okay. fair enough. <laughs> so we've we've got oil oil glands for our hair follicles. Uh, the mammoths did not. So any precipitation, any water that gets on their coat, is going to get them wet and is going to cool their bodies. This this fur, this hair doesn't help them in Arctic conditions whatsoever. Now, they can, of course, still survive. I mean, uh, what was that? Was It wasn't Attila the Hunt. Who was it that took uh, an elephants over the mountains through the snow and everything to surprise another country and then attack? Was it not Attila? It might have been. Yes, I believe it was. I'm, I'm thinking uh, it was, but I might be wrong on that one. Uh, the Maybe other, anyone the other one that popped in my brain. It, uh, it isn't it, but... Genghis Khan, but it wasn't Genghis either. No, I think it was Attila. Okay, okay. Oh, and we just got a comment here. I'm just looking at it. Uh, and it's actually Keisha. Uh, sorry if you... Oh, thank you. Sorry if you already said it, but what caused all of those volcanic eruptions? Was it the flood? Okay, excellent question again. Thank you. Um, basically... It was the continental division which happened at the end of the flood. So you've got continents, which we've discussed elsewhere in the show. Um, maybe we can bring that up on another show. Mm -hmm. uh, because a paper that was published a number of years ago uh, gave us really good reason to believe that the continents were dividing, uh, were moving around. We're told today it took millions and millions of years. Because, you know, currently the continents are dividing at the, you know, the rate of fingernail growth. Mm -hmm. Right. Which is real slow. But <laughs> when we take a look at the ocean floors, you can see cracks in the ocean floors mm -hmm. that indicate uh, curvature from what they call Coriolis forces. Now, the Coriolis effect is what causes hurricanes and... Um, the uh, Southern Hemisphere version of hurricanes. Um, my goodness, I've forgotten what they're called. Starts with a T. You got you me. Can't you can't remember either, eh? No. Ah. Yeah, the, the, but we do have a comment on your uh, on on the one thing that you had mentioned earlier about the woolly mammoths and it typhoons. Yeah, typhoons. No, that's the wrong the one. This one, Hannibal. Oh, Hannibal. Hannibal. Yes. Of course. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, Bob and uh, Indiana, thank you for that. Yes. And thank you, James, for typhoons. So, uh, in the Northern Hemisphere, the hurricanes rotate in one direction. In the Southern Hemisphere, typhoons rotate in the other. And that rotation is caused by the spin of the Earth. So, when you look at the ocean floors, you see the cracks in the ocean floors that were left behind by the continental division, and they are curved in the direction of Coriolis. But that can only happen if the continents are dividing at at least tens of miles an hour. So, in other words, all the continents moving around on the planet probably only it took less than a day for sure. Um, but it did not take long at all and it happened really rapidly. Well, if you take all of North America and move it even oh, 15 miles an hour uh, going due west, um, that is going to generate a whole mess of heat under the continent as it sl slides along or as the heat is coming from the mantle and causing it to move or whatever your favorite theory is. Regardless of you've, you've got a whole mess of heat 
producing a whole pile of lava and that's just coming up through cracks in the continents and it's spilling out on the surface of the con continents and that's why you get these massive lava flows that literally cover entire states and provinces you know um but anyway so we got sidetracked so it was a great answer but but, but that's Thank okay you, that, that these are good questions so <laughs> so coming back to the mammoths they have no oil gland no oil glands for their hair so any water is going to cool them they cannot uh certainly can't thrive one could argue that they couldn't survive in Arctic conditions. Um, and also, where are they going to get their food? 100, you know, 250 kilograms of food per day. Where's all that food going to come from? Do you see any food in that picture? I don't see much. But here's the kicker. So in Siberia, where the mammoths number in the millions, it's not just mammoths we find. We also find horses, camels, rhinoceros, lion, leopards, the bear, tigers, reindeer, the giant beaver, musk sheep, musk ox, donkeys. Did I mention camels? Yes, I did. Camels. Even camels. What are camels doing up in Siberia? You know, I've heard, like... I've heard a theory, and not to cut you off, and I'm sorry about that. Yep. I just, I heard this theory that just came to mind. I watched a program some time ago, and it, they unearthed a fully formed woolly mammoth, flash frozen, so it had to be frozen extremely quickly and under extreme cold temperatures, while the t contents of the stomach were still able, they were still able to examine the contents, what it ate that yes. day or whatever it froze so quickly it froze standing up now yes. what would cause that and uh, we of course biblically know the answer to that right well well I, i'm not sure i'm not so i wouldn't go so far as to say we know the answer you, you've <laughs> got you've got speculations you've got theories hmm. um michael lord has talked about that a lot uh walt brown is another one who's talked about that right. a lot um but uh michael lord is basically suggested that at the onset of the ice age basically these huge creatures just became snow fences for lack of mm -hmm. a better word um because the, the question arises uh you're you're absolutely correct first of all in everything you said uh there was some more more evidence involved that involves adult content so i won't <laughs> i won't go into it on the show because this is going to go on tv uh <laughs> but um but pertaining to the physiology as well and um it was incredibly fast and indicated suffocation and you are correct the the leaves in its mouth were so well preserved they were able to identify the plants that's right so it, it's astonishingly rapid um burial and freezing and if you just take an elephant and stick it in your freezer first of all I'm impressed. That's a big freezer. Um, <laughs> the The problem is you have to deep freeze it uh, instantly. Because if you take an elephant and stick it in your freezer, you can't freeze it fast enough. Uh, the stomach contents produce heat as they rot, as the, just from digestion, which then spreads to rot from the inside out. That's right. Um, because it's generating heat, it's generating rot, and it's a, an ongoing cycle. Whereas it's freezing from the outside towards the inside, and the interior has already started to rot before the outside freezing can get to the inside. So it's 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 a mystery as to why, uh, what exactly happened there. Um, Dr. Brown proposed that it was uh, water from the hydroplate event that went up into, well, basically outer space and dumped all its heat, became super cooled from outer space. And then when that came back down as precipitation in the form of ice and snow, it's super cold. So cryogenic temperatures. And Dr. Brown is proposing that that's what froze 
the woolly mammoths. And there's some a lot of questions and debate about that. Um, but the point being, it's not just the mammoths. Um, we have an absurd variety of uh, fauna, both animal and plant. And uh, in fact, it is so varied that, uh, as Michael Lord uh, put it, and Michael Lord was not the one to say this. This was actually an evolutionist he was quoting. And this evolutionist pointed out that the only similar diversity of mammals that we find today is on the Serengeti of East Africa. Hmm. That's pretty astonishing. This is Siberia we're talking about here. Okay. So we're going to come back to that. Remember this. It was so warm that the diversity of fauna and life was comparable to the Serengeti of East Africa today, the modern Serengeti. Um, so, Let's take a quick look at uh, the Greenland ice cores because this comes up a lot with the ice ages. So the Greenland ice cores, and there's a bunch of references here you can look up for yourself. Um, it is a fun topic, but uh, this one in particular uh, from, again, Michael Lord, talking about the ice cores showing 100,000 years mm -hmm. of, of ice history, ice growth history on Greenland. Obviously, for us Bible-believing creationists, a 6,000-year Earth, 6,000-year-old uh, account of Earth's history in the Bible, this is a challenge. This is a problem, or supposedly a problem. Let's examine that 100,000-year claim. So here we are. We're looking at, at Greenland and the ice sheets. And this one here, this is, a, uh, this is an ice thickness map and the deepest point of ice the the thickest ice cap is right here 3205 meters thick so way over 10,000 feet thick that's how thick the ice is on greenland it's pretty astonishing frankly and you can see here they've actually what they did the scientists have gone there over the decades and they've drilled core samples into the ice and they've just drilled down. They just built drill with a, a big pipe and they drill down and they pull a pipe out and they shove out the ice core um, that they, the ice sample that they just did. And they just lay it all out and it might go down for, well, three kilometers. Um, and so they'll lay out this, tube of the, this ice sample that's literally three kilometers long and then they look at it and they can study the ice layers and the ice growth and everything right so here's what here's several of the ice cores camp century and grip gisp2 and grip uh the renlin over here this was a former uh dew uh dew line site you know the the early warning system yep. that they used to have uh, during the Cold War. So this was one of the, the do sites that has was since abandoned in the early 90s. So they just kind of took it over and they, they've they done a number of ice cores there as well. Um, so the claim is that this ice has grown over 100,000 years. So here's, okay, so here's one guy with you can see the ice core sample here. He's just looking at one of the ice core samples. And what we're looking at here, so this is the drill. It's just a, a hollow pipe. And they just spin it down into the ice. And it, of course, drills out an ice sample. And then they pull that out. They lay it on its side. So take this pipe, uh, lay it on its side, shove the ice out the end. And now what you have is this ice core sample and they look at all these layers in the ice and they assume deep time they're thinking evolutionarily thinking and they're thinking thousands millions of years hundreds of thousands of years tens of thousands of years whatever they assume that all of these layers 
each indicate another year of ice deposition. So that was the assumptions they went on. And they were looking at things like uh, volcanic ash that might be in some of the layers, for example. But here's the problem. Every year, there's 20 to 30 explosive volcanic eruptions. Every year. So literally in, you know, even in a thousand years, you're going to have, you know, 20 to 30,000 volcanic eruptions. And now you want to go and try and identify which volcanic eruption did what on your alleged deep time scale. There's huge problems here with the assumptions just on that alone, right? But as someone kindly brought up last week or the last time we did the, the live stream, um, I'm going to come back to that, actually. So here's here's Greenland. And here's the ice core samples. I've only got two shown on this map. But notice I've drawn in. So here's the North Pole. And I've drawn in latitude lines with the Arctic Circle and latitude lines which line up with two of the major uh, Greenland ice cores. So notice that at the time they're saying, so this is their time scale. I don't agree with these ages. I'm simply using the evolutionist time scale that they proposed. And they are claiming that at this time, the time that they date all these mammoths and camels and lions and bears and rhinoceros, all these other creatures are up in Siberia. And all these creatures are actually farther north than the Greenland ice cores. And yet, so while it was over here, while it was warm and comparable to the African Serengeti, it was apparently basically an ice age over here, farther south. So hopefully I'm making sense there. Am I making sense? Absolutely. Oh. I'm following. Okay, okay, cool, cool. At least somebody's following. Okay. Maybe you can help out them help out the others who are getting <laughs> lost because I'm being confusing. Yep. Um and also I want to point out real quick, um, while one could argue within the context of a global flood, like the only person who would argue that would be a, a creationist, obviously, but it is something to worthy of consideration is that animals during a worldwide flood can be floated. If they drown, uh, mammals tend to bloat and float. Mm -hmm. And so the floodwaters can take them anywhere in the world. So, you know, the camels, the lions, the rhinoceros, etc. cetera, uh, perhaps they floated there. All right, let's assume that for a second. And let's just write all that off. There's one thing that will not float. That's fossil footprints from dinosaurs. So wherever those fossil footprints are is probably pretty close to where they were when they were made. <laughs> so we have dinosaur tracks here in uh, up in, on the North Slope in Alaska. We've also got some down here on this island. Look at how far north this is. This is way north of both of the major... Greenland ice cores. And yet here we find dinosaur fossil footprints. Right. Undoubtedly, the dinosaurs did not survive Arctic conditions very well at all. <laughs> and there was this huge debate that erupted when all these fossil footprints were found. Right. So the point I want to make here is going by their ages, you have monumental unsurpassable problems because on other parts using their time scale other regions further north they've got fauna that today would only be found on the African Serengeti at the same time when they claim these ice formations were around so um, what I want to do real quick is uh, let's go to the chats. Do you see any chats there that you want to? Yeah, I do have address? one here. Uh, jungle jargon. 
says the glacial striations on South America, Africa, India, and Australia show that they were connected to Antarctica after the global flood, flood buried the fossils below. Okay. I think I'm following what he's saying there. So the striations, I think you, you can see it even in North America, the um, upper states in the United States, you can see where the glaciers came down and actually created striations in the rock that are still visible today. And you can almost yes. see where the ice age ended by the striations. Um, yes. I've seen, again, a documentary on this, and I think that's what uh, Jungle Jargon is mentioning there. And you can see the yeah. striations all around the world. And and I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong there, uh, Jungle Jargon, but I, I think what you're saying is that basically these striations line up on continents now separated. Um, so if you put the two back together, the striations all line up and that, that of course is on top of that's in the, you know, the very top of mm -hmm. the rock and fossil record. Am I, am I following you there? Cause I'm, I'm not familiar with the striations argument. Um, yeah, it's, um, I did come across this a little while ago and I was <laughs> following it a little bit. I didn't get really too in depth about it, but mm -hmm. again, in the documentary I watched a while back, I could probably source it out and put a link, but um, they, they did follow striations and it, precisely to your point, it didn't matter what continent you're on, you'd go and you'd find these striations and they were kind of uniform. They followed mm -hmm. each other, um, exactly to your point on, uh, jungle jargon's comment there. Okay. And just a quick point on the striations. There is some debate over how they were formed. The uh, I'm, I'm certainly willing to accept that they might have been caused by, uh, for instance, glacial movement, dragging rocks across the surface. We see that today. Uh, so, I mean, there's something we can observe today that kind of matches. Um, mm -hmm. Some have suggested, however, that it was possibly uh, the receding floodwaters as they right. left the continents and basically moving rocks real fast across the surface, right? Uh, we talked about that in previous in previous shows, where, for example, uh, Cypress Hills uh, Interprovincial Park in Alberta and Saskatchewan, on the border of Alberta and Saskatchewan, it's composed of rocks that came from 700 kilometers away in Idaho. Right. And those rocks, basically, well, I won't go into it today because that's off topic. But basically, we we can definitively say they were moving at highway speeds. Hmm. So they probably made that trip in 10 hours. So massive wall of water moving at highway speeds, like 75 miles an hour minimum, um, or uh, which is 120 kilometers an hour, I believe. Um, and that's the minimum speed required to pick up the rocks in Idaho and move them and the water didn't slow down enough before it started dropping the rocks because it was running out of speed to carry them uh, running out of sufficient speed it was finally starting to slow down by the time mm -hmm. it got to Alberta and Saskatchewan um, so what was this wall of water and rock doing on the way there uh, was it making these striations I don't know um, I'm Probably. just saying there's Another possibility. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, anybody else or? Uh, we've got Star 198. Let's see what uh, Star 198. Pangea broke apart also at highway speeds as the continents divided. Uh, yeah. Pangea is another, yeah, another, another um, hypothesis or, or theory that we can look at as well. Uh, but. We'll have to save that one for another show because that, exactly. that that's a whole other Bible. show. <laughs> yep, because <laughs> that a came from the Bible, other. right? And it was hijacked by the old earthers, right? So. so, Jungle Dragon again, it's evidence in support of the earth being divided in the days of plague. Okay, okay, so that's what he's arguing. Okay, yeah, okay, so we'll move on, we'll come back to more comments uh later on, uh, during the mailbag. Um, however, what I want to point is to, so here's the Greenland ice cores and down here, you'll notice I have 
a little airplane marked. And mm -hmm. several people brought this up in the last live stream, in the last recording. Um, so here it is here. 1942, uh, it's now known as the Lost Squadron. And it was a number of P-38 Lightning aircraft, as well as some B-17 bombers, were flying over to Europe uh, in support of the war during World War II. And as they were flying over Greenland and Iceland, um, you got to remember, they're just using compasses. And that far north, it tends to they tend to be a little unreliable. And basically, bad weather moved in. So they got socked in at every airport. They had no place to land. They were running out of fuel. They found a break in the clouds. And they just ditched all the aircraft on the ice sheet in southern Greenland. So this is one of the photos that was taken by the U.S. Army after the ditching, and they just left the aircraft there. So this was 1942. So decades later, aircraft enthusiasts heard about this, and they're like, hey, we can go there, throw gas in the fuel tank, jack it up, make sure the landing gear and everything's running, start her up and fly it home. We have some vintage World War II aircraft in pristine condition. What more do you want? And so they spent years trying to find this lost squadron. The reason it was so difficult to find them was because they had, the entire squadron had actually become buried under 250 to 300 feet of ice. So in 50 years, this is 1992, um, some reports said 250, others said 300. And by the way, I was just finding out this morning, they actually have located another one of the aircraft uh, slightly farther away. Um, and it's about 300 feet deep, right about where they predicted it would be. So they're going to try and go back and recover that one as well. Um, but this one P-38 Lightning aircraft that they found, so you can see it was a pretty it was a pretty big deal. This was not a small job. They moved in and they had to melt tunnels in the ice, vertical boreholes. They had to melt down 250 to 300 feet. That's a long way down. And then they had to basically melt caverns, uh, melt away the ice, get rid of all the water. They had to pump all the water out and um, melt around the aircraft in order to dismantle the aircraft and take it out the hole piece by piece. And you can um, see a lot of this in uh, a Mega Movers episode. Um, I believe this was 1994, uh, but you can yeah, get it on iTunes. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, th I, I think it was, uh, I think you can get it on iTunes for like two bucks or something. Yeah, and it's, like, you know what, for, for anybody watching, if you haven't seen this, it's well worth the watch. It's fascinating mm -hmm. how they can go out and do this sort of feat. Really incredible. Highly recommended. Yeah, yeah it was. And so this is this is an actual uh, screen capture from mm -hmm. the show. Uh, so you can see the, the borehole that they melted. And they had to come up with a whole process of exactly how to melt this this takes a lot of energy and they're in the middle of remote nowhere <laughs> in Greenland and having in the to 90s. Build, in the nineties, having to just pound out a, a bunch of energy to melt the ice, to get down there. And um, also uh, David Hayes documented all this in his book, the lost squadron. Mm -hmm. And uh, this cover photo, I don't know how well this shows up on the live stream, but this cover photo that he has here, this is the cavern that they've melted. So this is 300 feet below the surface of the ice is where they're taking this picture. And there's the P-38 aircraft, which they've now melted out this cavern around the aircraft. Um, so he's got photos and all kinds of stuff in his book. And I, I again, I highly recommend it. Fascinating story uh, of how they recovered it. And that airplane, that airplane right there is now flying. I'm going to show you a picture of it in a minute. In a minute. Oh, there it is there. So Tino Gropi sent me this photo. This was, uh, it was Oshkosh is the name of the air, the air convention. 
And I don't know why I could never remember that the other, the other day when we were doing the live, the live recording last time. Uh, so Tino was at Oshkosh the one year and he didn't even realize when he saw it uh, the first day, he didn't even realize this was Glacier Girl. They named the, the aircraft. Uh, you That's can even right. see it there painted on the aircraft Glacier Girl. They named uh, they named a Glacier Girl. It is flying. It is up and running. Um, it's going to air conventions and air shows and flying demonstration flights and whatnot. So this was recovered. And uh, do make sure you stop in at uh, Tino's website, uh, genesisevidence.org. And uh, so thank you, Tino, for the photo. He has promised not to sue me, but <laughs> he said only if I don't get rich. If I get rich, apparently he might sue me. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> so let's take a look at this now. So here's where the Lost Squadron was found. So it was exactly 50 years between when it was, when the aircraft were abandoned and when they were uh, found and excavated. So in 50 years, 91 meters of ice had accumulated on top of the aircraft. 91 meters. That's a lot of ice. <laughs> so you break it down, that's 1.82 meters per year. Pretty simple math. So up here, the deepest part of the Greenland ice sheet, 3,205 meters, which is insanely thick. But even that insane thickness at 1.282 meters per year can accumulate in a measly 1,761 years. This is based on facts that we know, not speculation that those layers they saw in the ice, which we now know, as, as you were mentioning before the show, you why don't you tell everybody, Al, what you, what you know, because... You were right, right on the money with uh, yeah. What well, you were saying again, about the going, ice going to this one, going to this one documentary about uh, ice cores, how they had a um, a scientist. Uh, I, I, his name escapes me, but the scientist who studies ice cores for a living came out and he looked at them. They brought him in to examine them, and he said these are not annual rings in the ice cores or annual layers. They're not even seasonal layers. They're temperature change layers so every time the temperature would dip below whatever temperature it would create a layer and then when it would warm up the, the you know the sun or whatever it would create another layer they were temperature changes not seasonal or annual which right there debunks that long hundred thousand year two hundred thousand year um hypothesis yes yep and there was a bunch of variations a bunch of reasons for the variations there mm -hmm. um Okay, so let's take that and run with it for a minute because right now global warming is like all the rage. Mm -hmm. um, you know, oh no, we're good. we're warming up the planet. Um, but of course, th that's kind of old news. If you go look back and look at the historical uh, newspaper articles, magazine articles, etc., especially popular press ones where they're just putting it in layman's terms, um, it's gone everywhere from. Oh, the Earth is mankind has ca is causing global warming. To mankind is causing global cooling. Um, well, let's just come back to the ice age, which is one thing we can all agree on. According to the evolutionists, it was way colder in the past. We had global cooling. That ice age ended. That is massive global warming. Was that because of Neanderthal man's factories? Probably not. So it has nothing to do with people. That is that is global warming on what we would consider a catastrophic scale that had absolutely nothing to do with us, except, of course, for mankind's sin, which is what required the flood, which is what caused the Ice Ages. But... I won't go there. Uh, here's one New York Times article. This is only from 1978. And even in 1978, this is one article. International team of specialists 
finds no end in sight to the 30-year cooling trend in the Northern Hemisphere. And this just happened recently. This is from Rice University. I am not going to attempt to uh, pronounce the Icelandic name for this glacier because I want to prevent injury. Um, and Al, you don't, you don't have to either. Uh, but this is a glacier that is no more. It's a glacier that melted. And so uh, they made this memorial plaque. For the poor glacier. Can you read that, Al? Give it a shot. I, I can if you if you give me a moment. I would have to put it on my big screen, look <laughs> away from the camera, supersize the screen, <laughs> and uh, it's a little bit blurry. Okay, is the first Icelandic glacier to lose? You're gonna have to, talk to you have to move closer to the mic though. You're away from yeah. Away from I'd the say mic. it's a little difficult for me to reach uh, to read even on my large screen. Okay, is the first Icelandic glacier to lose its status? As a glacier, in the next 200 years, all our glaciers are expected to follow the same path. This monument is to acknowledge that we know what is happening and what needs to be done. Only you know if we did it. August 2019, 415 ppn uh, CO2, blah, blah, blah. There you go. I sort of did it. You did. You did a fine job. Not at all. <laughs> Isn't this... The poor glacier. Think of the polar bears. Aren't you <laughs> concerned, Al? I'm very concerned. Oh, the polar bears. What will they do? It's tragic. Oh, no. The glaciers are melting. <laughs> really? So the glaciers are melting, are they? Huh. You know, if we take a look in historical records in Iceland, and uh, this is from a fantastic series of articles that Peter Kledberg and Michael Ord put together in Creation Research Society Quarterly. So there's the reference there. Uh, they called it the Little Ice Age. There, uh, this is this is one list of see all these names, which again I'm not going to attempt to pronounce any of these lest I injure myself, um, except Brita. I, that one I can pronounce, or Brida. I forget how it's pronounced, but. Um, but they named all these glaciers after the towns and farms that they mm -hmm. overran. So in other words, people came into Iceland, Switzerland, Norway, Greenland, France. They built towns. They built farms. They were growing crops. And oh no, here comes this big bad glacier that wipes out the town. It overruns it. Now, a century later, these glaciers are melting back and revealing the towns and farms that they overran. So, question. Is it global warming? Or was it actually past global cooling and the Earth is simply recovering from this mass global cooling in the past? And this has absolutely nothing to do with people. Nothing to do with our fault. Is there anything we can do about it? No. Clearly we can't. And this isn't even going back that far. I mean, look at the dates. 1300, 1600, 1400s. You know, some of these go back as far as, you know, the 1100s. Um, but it was mostly in the 13 to 1600s uh, when most of these towns and farms were overrun by these glaciers triggered by what they now call the Little Ice Age. And um, not just the massive glaciers, but also ocean levels. So get a load of this. This is in Norway. This, uh, if you can see on the screen there, this entrance here and this ramp, this was for boats. So the ocean levels have gone down so far that their boat launch is no longer usable. Um, and this was from, so this is the uh, west side of the Acker's House Fortress in Oslo. Hmm. And uh, so this was uh, during the medieval times. And it is now, uh, so the entrance is now two meters above what is now sea level. 
So when they talk about, you know, oh no, global warming is going to melt the glaciers and all the oceans are going to rise up and flood our coasts. News flash. It's just going back to what was normal. <laughs> so what's the big deal? So anyway, uh, but this does tie in with the ice age. So I thought I would bring it up. Okay. Let's go to the chats and then we'll call it a night. So what do you got for me? Out the chats, I've got M and J Bray writes. So quick question with probably, uh, probably not a quick answer. And I can, apologize can you, if this was already on, covered. Sorry. Can, can, yeah. can you put it on the screen? I can watch this. Thank, oh, thank you. Thank you. A quick question with probably not a quick answer, and I apologize if this was covered earlier, but what is the most likely cause of the Ice Age during the flood as best as can be hypothesized? Okay. Uh, short, short, short answer. We did answer at the beginning, but it yep. was actually after the flood. And it was because of all the mostly tectonic upheaval that happened during the flood that uh, produced tremendous amounts of heat, uh, underwater volcanoes that literally flooded the continents with lava. Uh, mm -hmm. There was so much heat generated. All this heat was dumped into the oceans, what is now the oceans. And so warmer oceans produces massive precipitation from the oceans onto the continents. And a lot of that precipitation falls as snow and ice, and that accumulates. There's the start of the Ice Age. And the Ice Age ended when the oceans finally cooled down and got rid of all their heat and all the massive precipitation basically slowed down to, you know, what we now deem normal. <laughs> right. So that's the short, short answer. Well said. And this one from uh, George Bond, Viking, and I've read this somewhere before, so this kind of brings me back a little bit. Viking history shows they cultivated crops like wheat and corn in Greenland. What? Yeah. No. I've seen this before, and it's been <laughs> such a while. Maybe, George, you can uh, sort of elaborate on that one a little bit in your comments. Because, I, I again, this it refreshed my memory. I've seen this or heard something about this before. Yes. So it would be and great I've heard, to get a refresher on that. And I've heard also grapes uh, was another yes. uh, major crop. Um, I haven't really had opportunity. I have no reason to doubt it. Um, I just haven't had opportunity to look into it in more detail. Um, right. But yes, thank you for the, the comment, George. Mm -hmm. And we've got another one from Deborah Berkeley. Did God tilt the Hi, planets? <laughs> what did I say, Debbie? Deborah, my apologies. Yep. I was Deborah just saying hi. <laughs> Berkeley. Hi, Deborah. Uh, <laughs> this is interesting. Did God tilt the planet and not, and that tilting caused the ice at the North and South Poles? Okay. Why, are, why I, is the earth tilted at 20, what is it, 23 degree? Uh, it's not that much, but uh, I no, think 21. It is. 21? Oh, uh, now you're stretching my memory. So yeah. <laughs> I can't remember. Okay, still, yeah. very good question. Um, there's actually been both creationists and evolutionists who have uh, proposed things like that uh, for various reasons. Um, interestingly, now, unfortunately, I deleted the slides uh, due to time, um, but um, uh, Axel Heiberg Island, which, you know what, give me one second, I'm going to call up this slide because I actually have it marked on that map in the Arctic. I actually have samples of these, of this wood in my museum collection. And, um, okay, there we are. So, I don't know if you want to try and find that, Al. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Where, what slide is it? Do you oh, know? It's, uh, it's the one looking at the North Pole. It's, uh, I don't know which slide it is, but it's back a, a long ways. Yeah, um, I remember seeing it. Oh, a couple more. Keep yeah, going, keep right going, keep going. There. Big O. With the one. Boom. Right there. You the man. Okay. So I, you'll notice I've got one purple star right here. That is Axel Heiberg Island. And look at how close it is to the North Pole. The reason I have that marking there is because there is a fossil forest there that the evolutionists have claimed was buried in situ or in place. It was buried where it grew. 
Here's the catch. They claim it's 45 million years old, but the wood is still fresh. You can go in, you can cut it with a handsaw. You can drill it with a hand drill. You can burn it, light it on fire. In fact, I have samples of that wood, and uh, I sent a sample to um, Vance Nelson, who owns the other Travel and Creation Museum in Canada, and he was putting, uh, doing a research paper with uh, Brian Thomas from Institute from Creation Research. He and Brian put together a fantastic paper on carbon dating. I happen to know through Ian Taylor, who happened by chance, by chance, uh, praise luck, coincidence, and good fortune, Ian Taylor happened to call a carbon-14 lab the day that they were testing samples of wood from Axel Heiberg Island. Well. Wow. And that is the only reason we even know that they did those tests is because Ian just happened to call and was talking to the technician who mentioned this wood. <laughs> Amazing. So um, that's the only reason we even know they de dated them. Nevertheless, I sent uh, uh, some samples of my wood from Axel Heiberg Island and how I got those wood samples is a miracle in itself. Uh, I won't get into today, but it was one of the team members, one of the research team members. Um, and I actually got a whole box of it. Um, well, not me, but anyway, uh, regardless, I sent, so I sent Vance one of these wood fragments um, for their research paper and their research project. And so Vance sends me back this video he shot on his smartphone. He's got the wood fragment on a glass and he takes out a lighter and he lights my piece of Axel Heiberg wood that I gifted him lights it on fire and sends me the video. Now, for the record, you have to do that for carbon 14 dating. <laughs> so, yeah. There you go. It was part of the process. He just wanted to show off and do some pretty, shock value. Pretty spectacular story, though. It, it is. It is. And, just uh, really to hold a piece of that wood in your hand. Mm -hmm. would be amazing and and i forget the dates now they but they did get a good carbon carbon 14 date uh, i'm thinking it was around the five thousand year mark mm -hmm. um a far far cry from 45 million which is right. what they were claiming now here's the catch so those wood fra the the wood samples um even though the the team were very evolutionist in mindset um they did a lot of really, really good research. One of the things they did was they took a look at the tree rings, and perhaps we'll cover this on a future show. Mm. Uh, when you take a look at the tree rings and compare them to uh, tree rings from British Columbia, temperate climate today, uh, it was growing three to four times uh, thicker rings in one season than the British Columbia trees were. And there was no what they call late wood in the tree rings. Mm. The late wood is grown in preparation for winter. So in other words, these trees way up here, which the evolutionists are claiming were buried where they grew, had no, they did not experience winter. They were experiencing incredibly warm and uh, temperatures and incredibly good growing seasons. So they looked at this and they said, well, is it possible that this was actually, say, way down south somewhere in like temperate or tropical areas? And so what they did is they looked at paleomagnetic signatures. They actually looked at the paleomagnetism of the rock. They concluded that at most it might have moved maybe two degrees further north mm. latitude that was their conclusions so anyway take that and do what you want with it <laughs> okay that's so, interesting mm. all, all these rabbit trails that we go on they're kind of great because we could do a whole episode on each one yes yes let's go to whole the genesis chat, week right? episode on, <laughs> yeah, on rabbit trails hey we'll do a we'll do a genesis week on rabbit trails Okay, okay. <laughs> That's what was busy for an entire season. Yes, yeah, a problem. <laughs> well, here's another one. And let's go.
take this one back. John L. Davis, how far back, what years, do we have historical evidence of stories in the Ice Age? Now, I want to elaborate on that one. If we go back and look at this question, we also say, you know, in the red record, the Walla Mallam, we talked about flood stories around the world. Are there Ice Age stories around the world as well? Just to add to uh, John L. Davis's question. Okay. And you were going to look those up, weren't you? I was. <laughs> so I, I, I only mentioned the only ones I knew of, which were actually the ones that I just mentioned from uh, yeah, and, the Little Ice Age. And uh, the little bit of uh, research that I did in it, I didn't really find anything extensive, such as the, the, the Noah's Flood. Uh, right. That one is really, you know, global. Um, Ice Age, I haven't really seen any historical stories, I guess, from around the world. I've seen the pockets of them here and there, but that's about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the Walla Mollum, so far as I know, is unique in that regard in that it seems mm -hmm. to have, well, it's unique in a lot of regards, though. I, mm -hmm. I They do call it the oldest, the oldest records, uh, written records from the First Nations people. So, but it's, uh, it's unique in that I cannot, I'm not aware of any other uh, historical records, legends, myths that talk about uh, something that might appear to be an ice age. The Walla Mollum is the only one I know of. So right, right. Uh, same, same with me as well. So um, all right, let's go to Bob in Indiana. Does Joseph in Egypt coincide with the end of the ice age? Haven't got a clue. Um, let me think about that for a second. Quite possibly. I'm curious why you're asking that question. Well, you know, if he's still online, guess what, Bob? You can certainly <laughs> ask or elaborate on this. Question. Yes, please do. I go. am curious as to where you're going mm -hmm. with that. That's an intriguing question. And while we're waiting for Bob and Indiana's response to that, mm -hmm. let's go to George Bond. Uh, Fire and Ice video on Greenland by Creation Research, Joe Hubbard and John McKay. Are you familiar with this one? Uh, I'm not familiar with that one. I do know John quite well. Uh, we've done a lot of, uh, we've done a couple of field trips together. We've helped each other out. Uh, I quite like John, but uh, I'm not familiar with that one in particular. I will have to look that up now. I will have okay, to go man. to his website and see if I can buy that video. <laughs> sure. Yeah, we could do that. Now, this is a little bit off topic. We'll go back to George Bond, and he says, looking forward to your presentation of Polished Trade Fossils on Saturday Saturday for Truth Y2 YouTube channel with Paul Price, the great Ian Juby. <laughs> That's stand, Standing for Truth. Oh, is the, is? Standing for, oh the, yeah, Standing for Truth, yeah. Standing for uh, Truth. You know what? YouTube Amazing channel. debates on Standing for Truth. Right, right. Yeah, if if you if you like watching debates on on creation and evolution and stuff, they're pretty amazing. Um, uh, jungle jargon again, rabbit trail. There you rabbit go. Trail, yes. Touching <laughs> on the rabbit trails. <laughs> oh, right. Bob in uh, Indiana responded. Yes, he did. Let's take a look. Because of the drought that caused the famine. Oh, intriguing. Oh, very interesting. Because oh. it's also interesting that they had seven years of plenty before yes. the seven years of famine. Yes, isn't that interesting? That is. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to look into the timing of that a little more. Yeah. So, Jungle um, Jargon's uh, rabbit trail holds true right there. Yes, yes. So, it gets it gets a little little tricky because, um, you wind up with a lot of speculation as to when the ice age started and ended. Um, right. this, this is a lot of variables there. Right. Um, many of which we just plain don't know the answers to. So, but that is, thank you. That is a very, very intriguing question. Hmm. It really is. And you know, it would have been simplified if they would have put dates on the ice. Yeah. But what is up with that? We, we just couldn't, we just couldn't have the best of both worlds. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Jungle jargon again, tapirs. Uh, got separated separated from tapirs and mammoths and mastodons. Got separated from uh, mammoths and mastodons. Yeah. Hmm. Well, he was just making a comment, right? 
Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay, here we go. Uh, then uh, Deborah Berkeley again. Excellent question, Bob. And Bob says thanks. Hey, okay. <laughs> not only do they interact with us, they interact with each other. I love this. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and I did want to say hi to Iron Matt, and uh, again hi to Pastor Brian Ediger for thanks for joining us. Um, I saw them over on the Rumble chats, but I haven't called up the Rumble chats on the screen because uh, Streamyard doesn't support it. So right. Uh, uh, we've got oh. one from Darlene McMillan. Darlene, uh, this is a little while ago, uh, about half an hour ago or so, maybe a little more. Okay. Did we find mammoths buried in ice standing up, indicating rapid burial? We touched on that a little bit earlier. Yes, we did. Um, and yes, and it's the Verizovka? Verikovska mammoth? Mm -hmm. I think it was Verikovska. Uh, the name escapes me right now. Uh, the Verikovska ma mammoth, I'll go with that for the moment. Um, but, uh, the Verikovska mammoth was basically, it was, uh, if I recall too, its back legs were broken. Um, but it was standing, its front legs were stretched, uh, were stretched out. I believe its back legs were broken. So it was hunched back, but it was basically standing and it was basically buried standing. Um, I'm pretty sure that is the only one that was found like that. Um, None others come to mind at the moment. Hmm. So, good question. Good question. Interesting. Yep. And Jungle I see even Rail Evan Mechanic has joined us. Amazing. <laughs> That's great. Uh, Jungle Dragon. Everything was buried by tsunamis in the Arctic. Hmm. Could be. Could be. Uh, okay. One second. I'm going to call up. Uh, Give me a second here, Al. I'm going to call up the screen share here. Entire screen. So you can see the chats here. Uh, Pastor Brian Ediger, there's about 600 years between Joseph and the flood. I remember someone saying the Ice Age lasted 500 to 700 years. Yeah, and that would probably be Michael Ord giving that estimate. And he may very well be right. Um, mm -hmm. So that's a good point. Thank you for that input. Very interesting. Well, the chats keep coming in. There are uh, basic chats interacting with each other. Not too many other questions as we stand. Hey, we can go to the mailbag. Yeah, this is the mailbag. Oh, you, don't the actual, <laughs> you don't want the actual mailbag, though. Oh, yes. Okay, you can do that. You want to do the mailbag? They, they've all seen that one already, though. Have they? Oh, yeah. It's it's, uh, it, it's the little creature in the box's voice. It's amazing the sounds they emit. <laughs> Here, we'll play it for all you listeners out there. Okay, okay. Woohoo! Mail for me? <laughs> <laughs> Now, I have to say that one was created in directly from the Arctic. So, um, <laughs> yes, it was. Yeah, they, they revived had, it. They took its cells and uh, revived it. We still don't I know what to, species it is. Yes, I had I had to borrow a skill saw from my landlord to film that. <laughs> I was shortly after I moved to high level. Um, Love it. If you give me one second here, I'll call up the one I just remade. It was actually the very first mailbag filler I ever made. And it was shot in no joke, uh, 240p, I think it was. Oh, wow! And so I had to upsample it and make a new one, which was here that, it is right here. There was, you that the, was that in the time of Joseph as well? Uh, you probably was, yes. Um, hmm. give me one sec. Oh, there it is. There, uh, nope, nope, that's not it. That's not it. Where did I put it? Dynamite mail. That's upscaled. That's upscaled. That's upscaled. King Cobra. Liquid Strange Animal. Radioactive. Oh! I'm not sure what I did with it. Hmm. 
This makes bad. me sad. Oh, good. well. Okay. Some other day. We'll do it Some for the next day. live Some stream. Time. <laughs> well, how about we call that a night anyway? We could certainly do that. That was a good one. I, I really appreciate everybody joining us tonight with the questions. Great questions. A lot of information out there, and I'm so glad you uh, you participated in this one and, and join us for tonight's Genesis Week Live podcast. So anything, any last words from you, uh, Ian, before I actually close out? No. Okay. Other than thanks, everyone. Out, then. <laughs> so thank you to those who have joined us for the live recording of this show, and please follow us on social media uh, to find out when the next live stream uh, is so that you can join us and not miss a beat. So you could jump in and participate in the discussion. We'll be, we will bid you a good night and leave you with those words of hope and warning from our creati. Creati. Hey, we have a creati, Ian. I'm going to redo this one. <laughs> okay. This is a live stream, but I'm going to re-record this one. <laughs> I, You know what I did? I put this on my other screen, and I shouldn't have done that because it, I don't know what it does. It blurs out my image. All right, let's do this one again. So thank you to those. <laughs> thank you to those who joined us for this live recording of this show. And please follow us on social media to find out when the next live stream is so you can jump in and participate in the discussion. Now, we'll bid you a good night and leave you with those words of hope and warning from our creator, the Lord Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. So everyone have a wonderful evening and God bless. And God bless everyone. Thanks for joining us.